Hello, hello, and welcome to the Hollywood Outsiders special WandaVision After Ho. Today and each week after, we will be talking all about WandaVision, one episode at a time, what it means for the show, and also what it can mean for the MCU. These will be in the feed every Monday after a new episode, but if you support us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash the Hollywood Outsider, you will get early access to the episodes. Now, let's get on with the show. My name is Amanda Sink, and today I'm joined by my fellow guest ho, Vinny Schwartz. Howdy, howdy. Howdy, howdy. Are you just stealing my thing? <laughs> like, my whole vibe? Uh, yeah. You just, like, westernized my my welcome intro thing? <laughs> I guess that's a way to put it. Is that is that because howdy is kind of a more more western kind of uh, yeah sounded, howdy partner sounding uh, greeting there howdy yeah that was deep before we get into this episode keep in mind we are full spoilers through episode eight now and we will have to talk about this episode conclusion finale thing in a bit but. Let's talk about what the hex is going on. This is where we discuss our overall thoughts on the episode, any new characters, dissect the plot points to figure out what's going on. And we are talking about episode eight previously on, written by Laura Donnie and directed by Matt Shackman. In this episode, Wanda embarks on a troubling journey, revisiting her past for insight into her present and future. This is actually the second episode since episode four, we interrupt this program, not to have a traditional sitcom trope. We open in this episode in 1693 Salem with Agatha's coven burning her at the stake, for lack of a better word. But instead of killing her, she sucks them dry of life and their power, making it her own, including her own mama. She just says, sayonara. Yeah, and we kind of see like this slight bit of humanity from her like you could almost see how maybe she she just wanted power you know she wasn't trying to hurt anyone and she even tries pleading with her mother at one point that she can be good and you're not 100 percent. well at least i'm not 100 percent sure if that's genuinely her like being like hey you know let's just talk it out maybe we can go back home have a nice pot of children porridge <laughs> You know, just hash this out. And she's like, no, nah, no, nah, we got to get rid of you, which doesn't work, obviously. And it, it's a slight difference between the comic book Agatha and what we're getting here. But this is still a pretty cool jumping off point for her. Yeah. And I would say I don't believe her at all. I think she's just a very manipulative character that they are bringing to the MCU or M the, M yeah, the MCU. MCU? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but basically, I, I think that she is just trying to use that as a manipulation tactic because she tried being all, I'm soft and sweet. And then as soon as they were like, no, stop with your deception, she was like, okay, fine. This power bends to me. Well, I think she had that moment where she probably could have finished her mom off with the rest. But like I said, she had that slight moment because I don't think she's wholly evil. I think. Because she's lived so long, you kind of have that trope where you get these fey or undead creatures who just live so long, they really have no other interest other than their own. So that might come off as selfish and evil to us, but to them, it's just how they are now. It's self-preservation. It's just how they work. Well, I think current day Agatha is still all about power. She This entire time, it's been about her trying to figure out how Wanda does what she does because it is pure power that she wants to have for herself. And I think that, to your point, there is some selfish motivation there. And maybe it doesn't make her completely evil, but that is what her goal is. And so that does make her, at the very least, an antagonist. Oh, she's definitely an antagonist, for sure. I'm just saying, I don't think her intentions are wholly evil at this point. Again, we're not really sure what she needs right. power for other than her own self-interest but do, 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 mephisto. <laughs> we can only hope it's only day what <laughs> 55 of mephisto watch and still nothing yeah <laughs> so after we get a glimpse of who agatha has been and is today we flash back to her basement where Wanda's magic is no good, and Agatha takes Wanda 
down a memory lane of sorts to learn how she did this. Because like I said, her goal really seems to be figuring out how Wanda came up with this much power and how she did what she did, getting an entire community to work under her spell with complex storylines. Yeah, and we actually see her kind of that jealous kid in class who studies (laughs) their whole life, does really hard work, you know, puts in the effort, squeaks by with like an A minus, and they're like, yeah, those eight hours of study the night before really paid off. And then you have Wanda, who sleeps in class, uh, just kind of barely shows up. I love this analogy. Up. Well, because this analogy is me. <laughs> 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 and not, not every subject, but there are a couple where, you know, very minimal effort just shows up for the test and like, oh, hey, look at that. I got an A. And then, of course, Agatha is not real happy about the whole situation. She's constantly testing her. And she even mentions that the protection runes in her basement are rudimentary like they're basic like how do you not know these things yeah she does bring that up a lot and i assume it's because she's trying to show herself as someone who's very powerful and intelligent and this is just simple meandering things but i also think it's a way for the show to confront the audience and say hey she can do these things she can do transmutation And so part of our theories in the last episode were about what those creatures, who those creatures are, because we do get a nice little nod when she's down there and she's talking to the rabbit. Oh, and and yeah, she she's surprised to meet the real us. Right. And another thing this episode does, it really creates a floor for Wanda's powers. Like they've been somewhat nebulous in some areas and like extraordinary in others and you you don't get a real sense but with her showing that she's been doing this for hundreds of years right of just intense study and practice and she can do some pretty cool things but even she says passable illusions take a while and she's been training that for years and she's just able barely able to do that whereas wanda can do it just second nature So I think that and the scene we'll get to later at the house really just shows you exactly what her power can do. Right. And so this walk down memory lane takes us through back to when she was a child in Sokovia and her dad would bring home a case of American sitcom DVDs for them to learn English, but also to bond. You know, it was sweet because they would all hang out and have basically a movie night while war is happening outside their window. As you do. (laughs) As you do. But, you know, all of this is good and and happy until there's a Stark Industries bomb that destroys their home and kills her parents, leaving her and Pietro trapped. But this also gives us a lot of different information. One, this takes us back to our commercial from one of the previous episodes where the toaster had that beeping tone and the blinking red light. And we assumed it was related to it. But now we have a little bit more confirmation in the show, not just from the comics. And then this also creates a very interesting contradiction. Because what's that? Take a drink. (laughs) Because Pietro's reminiscence of what happened in Age of Ultron was that their family was having dinner And their parents went to check if there were any survivors in the debris, but were killed in another bomb attack. However, in this episode, they presumably died right after that first strike. So we're we're getting a little bit of contradiction from the films because it seems like they really want to incorporate the true value of Scarlet Witch based on the comics. Well, another thing, just a little nitpicky, but I believe they mentioned that they died... I don't know if they mentioned it or if you kind of like extrapolate that information, but supposedly they died in 1999 or 98. I think it's 99. And he has uh, Malcolm in the Middle in his case. And the show didn't first air (laughs) until 2000. So apparently dad has a time stone. There's just a little bit of detail that (laughs) has yet to be fully fleshed out, right? Sure. But basically, the purpose of this is to show and why this was important to Agnes and Agnes, Agatha. Yeah, we can can drop that now. Yeah. (laughs) And Wanda is because Wanda didn't fully understand 
nor did those who have been watching the MCU, how far back Wanda's power originates. And what Agatha was trying to show her is that she was basically this baby witch that stopped the bomb from going off. Because the whole time they were like, how long were you stuck there for two days and the bomb just didn't go off? That seems interesting. And so Agatha's telling her, no, you did a hex. And you stopped it from happening. You've had powers since you were a young girl. They just didn't fully flourish, you know, and we find out a little bit more about that as we get into the next scene. But, you know, it was a it was a great tie back to the comics to show the power of this particular witch. Yeah, she mentions that she used a probability hex, which was Scarlet Witch's first power is a little more undefined it was more probability and she could cause things to happen you know they didn't really have a defined power for her yet but she would hex things and it would cause things to maybe happen like maybe she hexed someone's shoes and they came untied and they trip and fall on their face (laughs) but yeah so that's a nice nod to that also we get the idea that her and her brother had these latent powers already so i think they set up a really smart way for the MCU to bring about the X-Men. Oh, where, right. Yeah. Where they're already there. They already have some latent dormant powers, kind of like a recessive gene. In X-Men, the whole thing has been about gene mutation. That's how they get their powers. And they even mention in Endgame, uh, Hulk mentions that the stones actually give off gamma radiation. So the theory is... That when the people got snapped and then unsnapped, the stones actually sent out doses of gamma radiation causing the powers to come forth. And now that's how we're going to get X-Men slowly showing up as people are going to slowly start developing and exhibiting these powers. And I think if that's the way they decided to do it, it's a really smart, really easy way to introduce them. How timely with them getting the rights to to these properties, right? (laughs) It's almost like (laughs) they planned for this. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Crazy how much they do. I I really, when this is all said and done, however many years in the future, I want a roadmap and (laughs) timestamps for how Feige set this all up and when he came up with ideas and when they implemented them. I I just need to know because... The planning that he did for what he did is just insane. Like, you got to give him. You almost wonder if he has some sort of time travel (laughs) ability or a time stone. He viewed over 14 million possibilities, and this is the one he came up with? Yeah. (laughs) Well, when Agatha presses further about how Wanda got her big guns magic, the door opens to when Wanda did the experimentation with Hydra using Loki's scepter that, as the MCU knew it to this point, gave her her powers, but this episode reveals that it actually only enhanced her innate abilities. Right, and we have that moment where it pulls out of the scepter, and we're not even really sure if that fully happens. It seems like the scientists are reacting to something happening, but we have some missing footage and Mm -hmm. some weirdness. But it finally explodes, presents the Mind Stone to Wanda, and she gets a vision Uh, (laughs) she she gets what now (laughs) uh, yeah she gets a vision of the scarlet witch (laughs) with yeah which which they explain the comics after they retcon her lineage and powers that the scarlet witch is actually kind of like a title handed down her grandfather and her real mother were the scarlet warlock and witch respectively until she inherited it and witches have More powerful witches and wizards and whatnot. They're associated with more complex colors. So, you know, I guess a weaker witch of the same variety of magic would be the Red Witch. But because she's the Scarlet Witch, she's a more powerful entity. So she gets that vision of the Scarlet Witch because you kind of see like the dress and the, I don't know what to call that, the face crown thing you kind of see like the (laughs) points at the top as she's floating down so whether that's like the past incarnation of the scarlet witch presenting herself or her future self or whatever but that's where she gets the most of her powers from and one other fun fact is in this flashback when wanda is watching the brady bunch and the doll goes missing that doll actually appears 
in the WandaVision episode Now in Color when Vision is using it to practice putting diapers on kids. Oh, from the episode? Yep. That's neat. Yeah. (laughs) I thought that was a cute little callback to their other episode. Interesting. Moving on up to the Avengers compound, the first home Wanda and Vision shared. She was grueling with grief over the loss of Pietro when Vision came in and actually kind of comforted her. Like, it was really sweet. Agatha even had a little tear. (laughs) It was a really, I don't know, I think it showed the level of humanity that an AI character could have, which was unexpected. And it was kind of that softer, sweeter side of Vision that we hadn't really seen in the MCU necessarily, because it was always about just doing the right thing. But how did that romance come between the two of them? And so this was a nice glimpse of how that started. And yeah, to your point, they really make they make it a point to show how human vision can be. That's the major difference between him and Ultron is that he had the capacity to understand and have empathy and realize that Humans may have flaws, but that's kind of what makes them and that they can overcome these flaws to be better. And they just keep writing such great lines for him. Oh, yes. One of the honestly, one of the greatest lines they've written for the entire MCU. What is grief if not love persevering? Oh, it's so beautiful. It's like poetry. And it it just really it just resonates so well. And you see that moment where there's the connection between the two. And they do such a great job with that. I really liked, though, that it started before his interaction with Wanda. It started with him not understanding the joke. And you get to see the impact, if you will, of Wanda on him. Because after they finish talking a little bit, he's watching the show. And he gets the joke and he laughs. And it's a really sweet moment between the two of them because... Now they're able, she's able to share kind of more of like a positive memory with her sitcom love because up to this point, it's been so much about so many sad things. You know, even when you take it back to her childhood and you think about why they were using these sitcoms, the purpose, it was so that way they could learn English and presumably escape this, this war mine that they're living in. And so she has so many sad emotions probably attached to these, not to mention while she was watching it as they sat trapped for two days, her and Pietro. But now she has something that's happy where she can laugh. She has a memory where she's laughing with Vision about the show. And I think that's kind of the beauty of television in general is the way that we use it to handle our own grief, to connect with characters that resemble us, to experience positive bonding with other people and build relationships. So I thought that was really powerful and important that they showed that. And I loved it. You know, you mentioned sad things and I just have to mention because for whatever reason, Infinity War is trending right now and everyone likes pointing out things that are happening right now with WandaVision and Wanda and Vision during the movies. Nothing but sad things happen to Wanda. Seriously. They just keep breaking her down and beating her up and like nothing good happens well Every- that's what happens when you're a woman <laughs> character in film and television is all of the bad things happen to you but you just persevere <laughs> like obviously all the characters have some kind of history and past and things happen to them but like nothing but things happen to wanda it's it's really sad yeah like nothing nothing good happens and when it does it doesn't last long well, I think Agatha it's pointed that out because she's like when Agatha's talking to kind of doing her her nice little recap, which yeah. I love her recaps, <laughs> but she's like, so let me get this straight. Your parents are dead. Your brother's dead and your lover's dead. OK. And I'm I'm sure as we've talked about, there's if she created these twins, which is possible, but it's also possible somebody else did and they can't live beyond the hex and something happens to that hex and her children die or something happens to her children i mean how much more grief can a woman take i told you as soon as they get whatever happens to them as soon as they're gone it's it's gonna be bad it's gonna be all bad chaos nothing but bad but we'll talk about that later yes (laughs) the big reveal comes after this 
Avengers compound scene when Wanda goes to S.W.O.R.D. to see Vision's body and director Hayward invites her back to his office. This is real, really where I wanted to punch him in the face because he had told us, the audience and Monica and the rest of the team, that she came in and stole Vision's body, that she broke in. She didn't do any of that, you lying P.O.S., she didn't do anything <laughs> bad. She wasn't nefarious at all. You brought her back and you showed her his dismembered body and even told her that he's not hers and that you're not going to let her bury $3 billion with a vibranium. And she even told you she's not there to bring him back. But still, you wanted to try to pin her as the bad guy, the bad girl, if you will. Yeah, Hayward must have had some kind of background in news broadcasting because man the way he edited that footage and spun that story <laughs> all i could think is fake news fake news yeah he just took the clips that looked bad and put it together and said ah here's my story this will work out great for me yep you can tell what his mindset is and how he views not only vision but superheroes at large he keeps referring to Vi he refers to Vision as the Vision. He keeps calling him a thing. He puts a price tag on him. He mentions how one is probably there to bring him back online. Oh, excuse me, back to life. Like he definitely only views Vision as a tool, or more specifically, probably a weapon. And I think we're getting a better picture. I mean, we got a good picture before, but a better picture of how. This man, or maybe he's not just a man, but I think he's a man who saw everything happen around him because of these superpowered beings. And it's a pretty common story thread in these, in like the comics and shows and stuff where there's superheroes and to meet these superheroes, bring they bring supervillains. Vision even mentions this in Infinity War that because they have power, they incite or they invite confrontation to match their power. So I think you have a regular everyday person who sees this happening and thinks that they have to do something. And they think that not only these villains, but these quote-unquote heroes are to blame, and maybe not even the Sokovian Accords are enough. So being that he's all about making these perfect sentient weapons... If we are introducing X-Men this way, I think this could also, if not the, if this isn't the introduction of AIM, it could be the introduction of the Sentinels, which were created to hunt down mutants and destroy them. Oh, what a so, good theory. So I think he's definitely on a quick path of becoming some kind of adversary for the MCU at large. Yeah, I definitely think that what he was doing was intentional. I mean, he tried to play it off like there wasn't, this wasn't planned. But when she dropped down to see him closer and she went through the glass and down and she said that she can't feel him, she leaves. But before she even, she didn't have to do any killing or attacking. There was no violence because he told his men to stand down and to let her see for himself. He wanted her there. He wanted her to to feel that grief, to want to bring him back. And then I know there's there's some talk about this property deed that she got from Vision of a house listed in Westview, New Jersey, where they can grow old that she finds when she gets back to her car. There are some theories out there, some people who are saying that it really did come from Vision. But I'm like, she looks shocked to see that sitting in her car. And it happened to sit in there just after she went there. That just seems too, a little too convenient. And so I feel like he probably got that into her vehicle because now she feels a little bit more driven by her emotions because she is a very emotionally driven being and superhero. And that's where her power really can just go crazy is if her emotions are going crazy. And so this is everything she needed to kind of put her in the place to do something strong with her power. And I think they wanted her locked away in, in if, if you will, like put to the side so she couldn't come and interrupt his vision plans. Because we already knew from Darcy's research, which by the way, where's Darcy and Monica? Still on their road trip. 
<laughs> Getting stopped every block. Right. <laughs> but we found out from her research that his plan was to bring Vision back. And we'll talk about what happens from the mid credits in a little bit. So I just I feel like he's been much more nefarious than they've led up to this point. I think he was really behind a lot of it that incited Wanda to do what she does, as we find out in this big scene. So about the letter, though, it's already opened in her car. So I kind of thought she opened it, saw it, and then wanted to go see where his body was. And then from there went off. I mean, it's possible, but I I feel like it could have just been left open. Like maybe it wasn't fully sealed or it was just opened in her car. Like maybe somebody intercepted it for her from her. Like that maybe he had it and they opened it because they wanted to see what it was. And then they decided to give it to her at the right time to try to incite her. May Yeah, I could kind of see that. But I think he actually got her that house because he mentions in the movies how they he wants to just run away with her. Like instead of going back, they just disappear and they live together and grow old together. And that also ties back in because... Scarlet Witch mentions that she just feels vision when referring to his being in the stone and all that. She says she just feels him, which then later, as she has to destroy the stone, he tells her that she can't hurt him. He only feels her. And then we get that moment where she says she can't feel him in the sword headquarters. So just more excellent writing to just really punch you square in the heart. (laughs) Nothing but sadness. And whether he actually (laughs) did buy the house or the deed or whatever, you know, I'm not debating that there's the real possibility that he did do it. I just think it was given to her at the right moment once she was, I, I don't, once she was vulnerable enough where her emotional state was a bit more vulnerable. She just saw him. She's feeling a lot of that. And I don't know. I just... That's that's just my thought. But we'll see. I mean, I could be completely wrong. Regardless, Hayward's dick, and he was definitely yeah, pushing I, her. I still got that note from a couple episodes ago. Sword guy is a dick. <laughs> also, fun Easter egg. Wanda's license plate at the bottom says Excelsior on it. Ah, I didn't even catch that. the famous catchphrase of Stan Lee. Okay, can we talk about her car? Because she's an Avenger. Surely she can afford something better than a Buick. Well, apparently Audi didn't want to sponsor the show, just the movies, so... The gender pay gap disparity is real, people. She's a woman and she doesn't get the nicer car, meaning she doesn't get paid the same. I mean, that could be true. I think it is true. I think we need to investigate the finances of these organizations. Maybe they only had so many cars and Iron Man took the Audi and all they had was like a Buick and like an old Pinto or something. She's like, oh, I'll take the Buick. It's fine. Sure. I'm sure that's it. <laughs> I'm sure that's it. But let's talk about when, what happens when she does drive to where this property D location shows where they were going to grow old at. And we see the real power of Wanda. I mean, I don't think I don't think anything up to this point has really shown us just how powerful, how and not just how much power she has, but how easy it is to exude that much power because really, I mean, she just had to do a little bit of backward bending <laughs> and she managed to take over an entire town, build a whole house. Can you come build me a house, Wanda? I'd appreciate it. And create a working, moving, responsive copy of her lover. Well, we get a slight peek at that in Age of Ultron when her brother dies. Like, she feels that and she has that quick little wave, that burst of power that just disintegrates those... Ultron bots, and that's just like the tip of the iceberg. Right, right. So we see here, she just fully out of nothing, seemingly, builds this perfect dream house, and then creates this spectral version of Vision, and then a body, which brings up so many questions that I have, because up to this point, she's been shown to manipulate reality and matter. Like when Monica went through, we mentioned her vest 
ended right. up being turned in with the rest of her clothes into more era appropriate clothes. So where did the matter for this house come from? Because if we're going to assume that, yes, there's there's gods and magic and space monsters and talking trees. But if we follow the basic laws of nature, you can't create or destroy matter. So where did it come from? Did she just pull it out of the ground or nearby houses? I don't know. But she crafts this house seemingly out of nothing. And then she seemingly makes Vision's soul because she creates this yellow energy that mimics mm-hmm. the Mind Stone's energy, which is how Vision got his quote unquote soul, which made him different from Ultron. So it would seem that she actually made some some kind of ghost to go inside the shell, and then she made the body. So that's what makes him more lifelike. Like she did give him something, like some kind of conscience and mind of his own. And he has a vibranium body because they they show that by tracking him back at the right. pop up sword headquarters. So that that is vibranium, which is a, apparently a super rare mineral from space. So that on top of everything else, I think that she's actually pulling these things from other dimensions. Like she's actually taking them from other realities, which would allow you to not break any laws of thermodynamics or anything like that. And also it would kind of explain some things like Vision not having any memories before Westview or of being an Avenger. And right. it would also explain her fake brother. Like maybe that is actually Quicksilver from the Fox version of the X-Men movies and she just pulled him from that universe. So technically he is Pietro, but He's from a different reality. So that's why some of his... Well, he might have some of Pietro's memories, but then also that was Agatha controlling him. So it, it's just... It brings up a lot of questions that I really need answered. Like, I I, I want it. <laughs> you got very sciencey there in the details. <laughs> well, it makes... I mean, good for you. It makes certain things fit and you just... Yeah, it, it makes sense. And it lends to what the future of the MCU is. We're kind of blending our vision section with our well, but that's fine. When you start blending reality as a whole and as we go on, it, it's just hard not to get into all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. But there there's also that really gut-wrenching moment where she drops to the ground that I don't know about you, I think anybody who's human and has an actual soul probably broke when she did. It was so sad. I mean, like I said, nothing but sad things, just nothing but sadness. She doesn't, even after losing everything, like like I said, she finally gets a little piece of happiness with Vision. Like she finally has someone to connect with that understands her and then he dies. And then she thinks maybe she can bring him back and she can't, like she said, she can't feel him. So he's gone. Well, she wasn't even thinking about that. That wasn't even her reason. She, I think that. It was put in her head after Hayward said something. Yeah, I mean, definitely. But then I think she did have that moment, like, maybe there's something in there, but she didn't feel anything. So at that very moment, not only is she completely alone, but she doesn't even have a home to go to. Oh, that's really sad. Right? When you think about everything. Nothing but sadness. (laughs) And it doesn't get any better, because after they finish their memory lane... Wanda hears her kids screaming, so she runs outside, only to find Agatha all like full witchy in the air, holding her kids hostage with her purple magic. And she reveals to us and to Wanda that Wanda is engaging in chaos magic. I love that she uses this phrase specifically, which makes her the Scarlet Witch. Yes, the Scarlet Witch. As I mentioned earlier, it's kind of like a title. And it it just shows exactly how powerful she is with this chaos magic, because that was also introduced later to kind of give her more solid grounding in her powers and what that means. And I think it it is really exciting because they're really sticking with that in the comics and just setting her up for how crazy powerful she can be. And I think this is definitely going to be the catalyst for our, our multiverse stuff. Yeah, 
And then the episode is not over for the second episode in a row. We get a mid credit scene. Hooray. <laughs> Except for it's not anything fun. It's Hayward bringing Vision back Ooh. using Wanda's magic as a source to power it. And he says, you know, we've been working on this for so long. And all we needed was to go straight to the source, which is a little bit of Wanda. Right. A little bit of Wanda <laughs> in your life. <laughs> and that brings up so many more possibilities that are going to be answered next week. But I want it now. Because, uh, <laughs> again, we go back to how Vision was kind of being created in Ultron's image. But because of the Mind Stone, he has that consciousness and he's a little more human and he's not like Ultron in that way. But this thing is just Vision's body, not his soul. So this thing is actually going to be a lot more like what Ultron had envisioned for Vision. And he's not going to have that ability to kind of rationalize things in a way that'd be a little more human. He's going to rationalize things like a robot, like a computer. Things are going to be very binary. And I mean, the implications are crazy and scary. And it's going to be all kinds of intense when him and the Hex Vision kind of go toe to toe. Because I mean, that's definitely going to happen. Yeah. And a lot of this stuff has happened in the comics, including, you know, what you're talking about, including Vision being revived with an all white color. That happened in t- to, <laughs> to him in the comics. Because he was dismembered, similarly here, and Wanda sees him dismembered. And when he's brought back, he's brought back with all but his humanity. So he's brought back without any color. And his skin pigment. Yeah. One in the same, apparently. Racist. They whitewashed him. See? Hayward is a piece of crap. (laughs) He sure is. So let's talk a little bit about the vision, you know, where we talk about what we see going forward and how it connects to the MCU. We've talked a bit about it already, but summarize some of your thoughts about what you see happening in this next finale episode, question mark, (laughs) because I and I know I'm in the minority here, but I truly believe that there's a hidden 10th episode. Now, before I hear the same remarks that I've heard before, yes, I know that this finale is supposed to be on episode nine. And then they're going to do a how the making of, like how we made Scarlet Witch WandaVision. But there was also a one of the talent agencies that represents one of the smaller characters. They had put that this character, that this actress was in episodes 7, 8, 9, and 10. Hmm. So that leads me to believe, plus we have a lot to wrap up. Yeah, we do. In one probably 35, 40 minute episode. Maybe they messed up and this next episode's actually going to be two hours. <laughs> That's where all that time went <laughs> in the episode mix ups. Yep. We're going to get a whole movie. I mean, I would not be opposed to it. But I'm really hoping that they wrap some of this up so that way we have, I want a, like a conclusive series or season to the show so it's rewatchable. In itself, not just like, okay, we connected it here. It's just like a middle piece until we can get to another movie. I want it to be a show that can stand alone and have some conclusion. And sure, if it leads into the next movie, I'm happy for that to happen. We know it's going to happen. But I'm going to be really pissed if it's just like a cliffhanger that leads to the movie. I don't think they'll do that. I think they've been very good about... Kind of intro. I mean, they haven't done shows so far, so this will be slightly different. But as far as the movies go, they're really good at giving you a story and kind of containing that story for the most part, giving you a satisfying ending for most of the movies. But they do definitely introduce elements or characters that will be important later on, like Infinity Stones and whatnot. So. I think that they will give you some kind of conclusive end, but I think the repercussions of that ending are going to be long and reverberating throughout this phase of the MCU. Okay, well, I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> Trust me, I got I got lots of things, lots of things to talk about, like how, okay, I kind of stretched a bit on this one, but in an interview, Paul Bettany does mention that he does get to work with an actor he's always wanted to work with. It better be somebody who's playing Mephisto, because my <laughs> Mephisto theory is not done here, people. Someone that he's never worked with before. 
and that they have some really great intense scenes together. So like that could be any number of actors or actresses, you know, it's, it's kind of needle in a haystack, but I went searching <laughs> for the needle in the haystack and this is a little reaching and it's one of those theories that make you look a little crazy until it's true or not. But I think because Richard E. Grant is in the Loki show for all six episodes. The Loki show was supposed to come out around the same time as WandaVision. In one of the scenes of the Loki show, it shows Owen Wilson's character with a young girl talking and in framed very well, very brightly. So definitely not just, oh, you know, it's background dressing is a stained glass portrait of a man with red skin and horns and a robe. Now there's, you know, a big universe (laughs) for the MCU, but there's not many characters that look like that. So Richard E. Grant and Paul Bettany have never worked together. I'm not sure if they've ever talked or if he would be excited to work with them. He's, he is a pretty prolific actor, but he has such a good look for Mephisto. Just looking at him, I think he, he at the very least has the look and I think he could pull the character off very well. So I'm going to claim that Richard E. Grant is Mephisto and he's going to show up at least towards the end of next episode. If you're right, I'm going to give you $10. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, it is a big stretch and you did <laughs> research. I'm going to give you $10. This is a bet. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. Uh-huh. Just if you're right, by whatever chance of God or somehow you you got a leaked screener of the next episode. All right. Talk to Mephisto himself and yeah. sold him something. <laughs> Your soul. <laughs> then I'm going to give you $10. I mean, just just going down that crazy rabbit hole and being right would be enough. But yeah, sure. I'll take 10 bucks. <laughs> See, my theory is much more simple. I did not map out who Mephisto could be. All I know is that Mephisto is not done for me. That theory is not gone. I think this character is still going to show up. Especially because of all of the all of the comic book ties they've made to WandaVision. It just it seems so ridiculous that they would not introduce this character who has such a significant tie to Scarlet Witch. It it would just be very bizarre. I mean, I agree. I I don't think he's been introduced yet. Like we've even made a couple assumptions that maybe fake Pietro is Mephisto or whoever but i don't think at this point he's been introduced or the bunny he could be the bunny (laughs) Uh, we thought it was we thought it was her son but you know i think i think it's still her son i don't think i don't think we've been introduced to him yet i think he's going to show up towards the end and be like surprise it was me all it was actually me all along (laughs) it was mephisto (laughs) all along oh we should talk about the remix there is a (laughs) trap remix of that song by Leland Philpot, and it is incredible. They he's he's given you the free song to download if you want it, which I have, of course. <laughs> and if I don't, when COVID is over, if I don't hear this banging at every club, not that I go to the clubs, but I'm gonna go just for the song. And if I don't hear that banging in every club, I'm gonna lose it because this song is so good to begin with, and then this remix is even better. I, I mean, I could definitely see that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so check out Leland Philpot at YouTube and Twitter. Any other theories for WandaVision? Well, I think we are actually going to see more Agatha Harkness. Thank God. Oh my God. Catherine Hahn is amazing. Can we talk about how incredible? I mean, we know I mean, that I she's- do almost every week, so sure. <laughs> but like literally- she blew my mind because I know she's funny and I know she can be charming and and she has typically a very standard acting style, if you will. But I feel like she's gone and branched so far out. I mean, just the level of confidence and cockiness, if you will, that she exudes when she's talking to Wanda and her m- mishmash between the type of personalities when she's when she's back in Salem, and she's being so sweet, and, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, to, oh, I'm so powerful and evil. (laughs) It is just magnificent, and I just, I applaud her, I love her. If she does not win an award, 
then somebody obviously has not been paying attention. Well, I think uh, superhero properties are a little looked over at the moment, but I think very soon we're going to have to start accepting them as wonderful pieces of cinema and art. And that's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. (laughs) I can't wait for that. Take that, Scorsese. Scorsese. (laughs) But yeah, so back to my previous point, I think we're going to see a lot more of her because I actually mentioned this a little bit last episode. She actually is there to scope out what's going on because she felt the magic coming from Westview. And when she figures out what's going on and sees Wanda's full powers and who she really is, she realizes, oh, you're actually a problem. Like, you could ruin reality as we know it. We should probably actually do something about that. Now, obviously, that's not in Wanda's best interest. And again, I think it might seem selfish and evil from our standpoint, but from her standpoint, she's been around for so long. She's seen so many things. And to see this, it actually kind of shakes her a little bit and She's probably thinking more, obviously, of herself, but also as reality as a whole. I'm sure she'd like to keep, you know, reality around. I'm sure she likes living. So she thinks that Wanda's far too dangerous. And after this is all said and done, I think she's going to stick around to help train Wanda like she does in the comics and help her get a better control of her powers. So they'd, they'd be so foolish not to do that. They would. Just for a story standpoint and because Catherine Hahn's been doing so great. <laughs> She's so great. And they have really good chemistry together, too. Oh, yeah. Just, just the two actresses. So. Yeah. And go back to being all buddy-buddy like they mm-hmm. were in sitcom world. Slightly different, you know, more magical hijinks. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite witchy witches. <laughs> and then there's another very small possibility, just because it has happened in the comics, so I have to bring it up, is that... The events leading up to the aftermath of House of M, which is revealed in a Young Avengers comics called The Children's Crusade, that the whole time Wanda is being manipulated by Doctor Doom Mm -hmm. so that her emotions would go out of control and he could use those powers to his gain. So it it could be, maybe that's the tie-in instead, but I kind of like Mephisto a little bit more, but I don't know, maybe Doom? Regardless, we agree that there is a big bad that's badder than what, we, what we've seen so far. Yeah, I definitely think between her children and the two visions and the whole 45 minutes of craziness we're going to get. Oh, and Monica, wherever she went with right. fake Pietro. All these things are going to come to head next episode and it's going to be crazy and it's going to be bad. There's, there's something bad's going to happen. Something real bad's going to happen. And like I mentioned, Wanda's just, she's going to snap. Like you, the the part where she breaks down, that was bad. But that was her just kind of like breaking down and just having that grief wash over her. This is going to be just a full on break, like a snap. It, everything's just going to let go. And that's how we're going to get this tear in reality. And universes are going to get shattered and splintered and smashed together. And that's going to set up the rest of the craziness for this phase of the MCU. Well, with that in mind, (laughs) that's going to do it for this episode of WandaVision. Remember, you can find The Hollywood Outsider on your favorite podcast app. Make sure to subscribe, like, and share it with your friends, family, colleagues, whomever. Your dog. Yeah, share it with your Your dog. neighbor. (laughs) Just just play it in your home theater very loudly. Share it with your neighbor. I'm sure they'll love it. (laughs) You can find us on Twitter at Buy Popcorn, on Instagram at The Hollywood Outsider, and we're on Facebook and LinkedIn under our name, The Hollywood Outsider. You can also find all of our reviews and other content on the website, thehollywoodoutsider.com. Shout out to all of our Patreon subscribers. We really appreciate you. And if you're interested in signing up, you can go to patreon.com forward slash The Hollywood Outsider. Remember, the next time you watch WandaVision on your couch, buy popcorn. Are you going to say anything or are you just going to mess with your eyebrows? Like, Well, what was I supposed to say to that? People can't see your eyebrows. I know. I'm doing that for me. (laughs) Okay. This isn't staying in, by the way. Yes, it it is. No.